Simon Peter, if thou lovest me, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Hello, my friends, and welcome to True Heroes. Today, we're going to look at the life of St. Silverius, whose life, as it was with many popes of the early church, was one of constant suffering, finally ending with his death in exile. Let us begin his story. Upon the death of St. Agapetus, after a vacancy of about 47 days, Silverius, being then a subdeacon, was chosen as Pope and ordained on the 8th of June, 536. Theodora, the Empress, seeing Justinian master of Rome, resolved to make use of that opportunity to promote the sect of the Acephali, which is a kind of branch of the monophysite heresy, which does not accept the concept of two natures in our Lord Jesus Christ. Anthemus, patriarch of Constantinople, was suspected of helping with this, and by the credit of the empress had been transferred against the canons from the see of Trapezus to that of the imperial city. When Pope Agapetus came to Constantinople in 536, he refused to communicate with Anthemus because he could never be brought to own in plain terms two natures in Christ. Whereupon he was banished by Justinian, and St. Menace, an Orthodox holy man, was ordained bishop of Constantinople by Pope Agapetus himself, who by a circular letter notified that, quote, the heretical bishop had been deposed by the apostolic authority with the concurrence and aid of the most religious emperor, unquote. This affair gave the empress great uneasiness, and she never ceased studying some method of recalling Anthemus, till the taking of Rome offered her a favorable opportunity of attempting to execute her design. Silverius being then in, her, in power, she endeavored to win him over to her interest, so that now Agapetus is dead and Silverius is now pope. And she wrote to him requiring that he would acknowledge Anthemus a lawful bishop or repair in person to Constantinople and re-examine his cause on the spot. The good pope was sensible how dangerous a thing it was to oppose the favorite project of an empress and said with a sigh in reading her letter that this affair would in the end cost him his life. However, he, without the least hesitation or delay, returned her a short answer by which he gave her to understand that she must not flatter herself that he either could or would come into her unjust measures and betray the cause of the Catholic faith. The Empress saw from the firmness of his answer that she could never expect from him anything favorable to her impious designs, and from that moment resolved to compass his deposition. Vigilius, archdeacon of the Roman Church, a man of address, was then at Constantinople, whither he had attended the late Pope Agapetus. To him the empress made her application, and finding him taken by the bait of ambition, promised to make him pope and to bestow on him 700 pieces of gold, provided he would engage himself to condemn the Council of Chalcedon, which had condemned the Monophysite heresy, and receive to communion the three deposed Eutychian patriarchs, Anthemus of Constantinople, Severus of Antioch, and Theodosius of Alexandria. The unhappy Vigilius having assented to these conditions, the empress sent him to Rome, charged with a letter to Belisarius, commanding him to drive out Silverius and to contrive the election of Vigilius to the pontificate. Belisarius was at first unwilling to have any hand in so unjust a proceeding, but after showing some reluctancy, he had the weakness to say, quote, The empress commands, I must therefore obey. He who seeks the ruin of Silverius shall answer for it at the last day, not I. Unquote. Vigilius urged the general on one side to execute the project, and his wife Antonina on the other, she being the greatest confidant of the empress, and having no less an ascendant over her husband than Theodora had over Justinian. 
the more easily to make this project to bear, the enemies of the good pope had recourse to a new stratagem and impeached him for high treason. This is how this went about. Vidiges the Goth returned from Ravenna in 537 with an army of 150,000 men and invaded the city of Rome. The siege lasted a year and nine days, but the latter defeated all the attempts and stratagems of the barbarians and in the end obliged them to retire. The Pope was accused of corresponding during the siege with the enemy, and a letter was produced which was pretended to have been written by him to the King of the Goths, inviting him into the city and promising to open the gates to him. Belisarius saw evidently this to be a barefaced calumny, and discovered the persons who had forged the said letter, namely Marcus, a lawyer, and Julianus, a soldier of the guards, who had both suborned by the Pope's enemies. The general therefore dropped this charge of treason, but entreated the Pope to comply with the will of the Empress, assuring him he had no other means of avoiding the loss of his see and the utmost calamities. Silverius always declared that he could never condemn the Council of Chalcedon. Upon leaving the general's house, he fled for sanctuary to the Basilica of the Martyr St. Sabina, but a few days after, by an awful stratagem of Belisarius, was drawn thence and summoned to repair to the Pincian Palace, where the general resided during the siege. He was admitted alone, and his clergy, whom he left at the door, saw him no more. Antonina received him, whilst Belisarius was seated at her feet. She loaded him with reproaches, and immediately a subdeacon tore the pall off his shoulders. He was then carried into another room, stripped of all his pontifical ornaments, and clothed with the habit of a monk. After this, it was proclaimed that the Pope was deposed and became a monk. Belisarius the next day caused Vigilius to be chosen Pope, and he was ordained on the 22nd of November, 537. In the meantime, Silverius was conducted into the banishment of Patara, Patara in Lycia. The bishop of that city received the illustrious exile with all possible marks of honor and respect, and thinking himself bound to undertake his defense soon after the pope's arrival, repaired to Constantinople, and having obtained a private audience, spoke boldly to the emperor, terrifying him with the threats of the divine judgments for the expulsion of a bishop of so great a see, telling him, quote, There are many kings in the world, but there is only one pope over the church of the whole world, unquote. It must be observed that these were the words of an oriental bishop and a clear confession of the supremacy of the Roman see. Justinian, who had not been sufficiently apprised of the matter, appeared startled at the atrocity of the proceedings and gave orders that Silverius should be sent back to Rome, and in case he was not convicted of the treasonable intelligence with the Goths, that he should be restored to his see, but if found guilty, should be removed to some other see. Belisarius and Vigilius were uneasy at this news and foreseeing that if the order of the emperor were carried into execution, the consequence would necessarily be the restoration of Silverius to his dignity. They contrived to prevent it, and the pope was intercepted in his road towards Rome. His enemies saw themselves again masters of his person, and Antonina, resolving at any rate to gratify the empress, prevailed with Belisarius to deliver up the pope to Vigilius, with full power to secure him as he should think fit. The ambitious rival put him into the hands of two of his officers who conveyed him into the little inhospitable island of Pomaria. In this place, Silverius died in a short time of hard usage. Some say he was even perhaps poisoned by Antonina. The death of Pope Silverius happened on the 20th of June, 538. Vigilius was an ambitious intruder and a schismatic so long as Silverius lived, but after his death became lawful pope by the ratification or consent of the Roman Church, and from that time renounced the errors and commerce of the heretics. He afterwards suffered much for his steadfast adherence to the truth, and though he entered as a sort of mercenary, he became the support of the Orthodox faith. From the life of St. Silverius, let us learn to fight for the good of the Catholic Church 
even if that is to cause us great suffering. We should be willing to suffer everything for Christ. Let us do so in our daily lives. Tomorrow, we will look at the life of St. Aloysius Gonzaga, a Jesuit known for his purity, who died of the plague in 1591. Until then, God bless you all, my friends. St. Silverius, pray for us.